Hello, I'm Craig Constantine. And I'm Kate Field. And it never ceases to amaze me that you can do this across the entire planet. Kate is, or, or let's let's be nice, I am on the entire opposite side of the globe. And thank you for getting up very early, although we are we are playing into the time change. You, you shifted uh, ahead? Yeah, so it's spring here. So our clocks right, went forward. Right, because I'm like... And in another, actually, we're moving backwards very late this year, like November something, which is really late for us. And then mm. we're moving back, which I guess would make it even another hour closer or another, or yes. like, yeah. I, I don't know. I, yeah. I really have trouble <laughs> to get the map out where, but there's like a, there's like a website that will give it two cities and it, it literally makes a circle of smiley faces and mediocre faces and frowny faces to tell you the times of day and <laughs> Like that's the tool that I need. Anyway, I'm off on a tangent. I'm notorious, but thank you for getting up early. And we met, uh, was probably two, two and a half years ago in like, it used to be called TPF three, I think, um, is probably where we met. Yeah. So I'm like, it's so. super cool to see. And like, um, we were talking beforehand about imposter syndrome and you're making me feel all nervous because your pet peeve is podcasters who don't edit well. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm not going to do any editing. But no, anyway. but this is different um, because that's part, uh, of, that's part of, you know, that's actually, th you lay it out that that's what you do from the very beginning you've laid yeah, that right. out. That's a very different get, thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, so there's a couple of things like th this isn't, necessarily a show about making podcasts that happens to be what we talk about a lot and i'm i'm wondering like i know a lot of the backstory or some of the backstory and i'm just wondering you're i'm going to say you're tenacious so you would say you have imposter syndrome but i'm going to say you're tenacious because you're 20 plus 25 episodes in and you're still like i mean you don't make an episode every week but you're still making them you still are creating them in your head you're still participating like i see you in like um, everybody knows this who's listening, but the podcasters hang out in certain circles. Kate's still there and you're super busy and you have things to do, but like podcasting just doesn't seem to fall out of your head. Like it's, you you know, like, you're like, I would say that you're like a dog with a bone. Like, so what is it about podcasting that you just keep coming? Um, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth here, but you keep coming back to podcasting. Like, do you also come back to quilting or like, what is it about podcasting? <laughs> Definitely not quilting. <laughs> um, uh, podcasting. I really enjoy the community. I love being part of the community. I find I've met some really interesting people through the community and I, um, I'm i naturally curious and I want to have interesting conversations with people. The world is an amazing place. In my actual real job, I get to meet people that I'd never otherwise meet. And some of the amazing stories that people have shared with me have enriched my life and my experience of the world so much. And I get that through meeting other podcasters and going on um, the podcasting journey with them. I'm also quite an avid consumer of podcasts when I can be. I have a bit of a commute to work. I live on a farm. I work in the city, so I commute about 45 minutes each way. So I often use that time uh, to listen and consume podcasts. I really enjoy listening to podcasts. I love the audio um, format. I also do have the podcast and the conversations that I want to have with other people in my brain and I get to have wonderful conversations with people about the topic of my podcast which is um, farming for the future really so some people call it regenerative farming other people call it carbon farming uh, a lot of it's just backyard gardening to be honest Backyard gardening is farming just on a tiny, minuscule, micro, micro scale, yep. a nano scale. And so, and, and everyone has to eat and largely wear clothes. So farming affects all of us. And a lot of people are so disconnected from that, that I want to um, bring that to them. So I feel like I have a duty almost to share and to help educate and to highlight what it is about farming that is so important for all of us to understand and how we can do it and uh, mitigate 
some of the greenhouse gas emissions um, because climate change is the biggest, most important thing that we need to be thinking about, more so, I think, than the pandemic, uh, which is the topic on everyone's mind, particularly in Australia at the moment, as our vaccine Mm. rates are slowly, slowly, slowly getting to a reasonable level. Hmm. So there's so many, th- <laughs> so many things to pick on and not, not to pick like in a bad way, but like so many, I always, in my mind, I always have like a vision of the host show up with a tapestry and I'm always like looking for which thread to pull on. And on one hand, I want to ask like, sometimes, like, sometimes I do this to people, I'm like, here, I'll give you a bunch of questions. You pick which one you want to ask. I mean, which one you want to talk about? One of them is how did you get into making cheese? Um, and, and why goats? Like, cause I'm, that, I'm just super curious about that. Another one would be, do you remember the first time you thought about creating your own podcast? Two completely different questions. You can answer one or the other or both. Oh, or the cheese story is so much more fun. <laughs> yeah, let's do that um, one. <laughs> so we, uh, we haven't been on the farm for very long. Neither of us come from, this is my husband and I, um, we haven't come from a an immediate farming family. We've had uh, extended family members who are farmers and he was actually an academic, so he was um, what you guys, I think, call a professor, but professorships in Australia worked differently. He was lecturing and teaching and supervising PhD candidates at university in marine vertebrate ecology and ecology in general. And we were in Sydney, which is a great place to live if you want to live with one in five other Australians. We're not big city type people. We'd come to Sydney after being in Darwin, which is right up the very northern centre point of Australia, 11 degrees south of the equator. So a a, um, a climate more akin to Florida than to hmm. um, where I am now, which is right down the bottom of Australia, which is 42 degrees south. Um So we'd moved from Tassie where we'd both met at university because we'd travelled from other places to go to uni, then to Darwin together while he pursued his academic career and I pursued my professional career, then to Sydney. And we sort of got to this point in our our careers and we just looked at each other and went, oh, this is not fulfilling. We're interested in having, you know, the worst house on the best street, which is going to cost us millions of dollars, decent cars to sit in because we're sitting in traffic the entire time. Where are we going to send our children to school if we have children? And we just looked at each other and went, oh, my goodness, we're becoming consumers, like the people that we used to Mm -hmm. laugh at when we walked around the cities, the streets of Sydney in the evening with the dogs when we first moved there. And we just went, oh, no, let's bail on this. And we were making cheese in the kitchen for fun after doing a couple of, you know, weekend-type cheese-making courses. And we just went, oh, we can make cheese commercially because, yeah, same people think that they can make cheese commercially. And we sort of went, oh, How much well. trouble could that be? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've went, learned okay. a very important lesson there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we sort of went, okay, well, if we're going to make cheese, we need milk. And if we need milk, we need animals. We'd always had a plan to have a farm at some point in the future, probably, you know, not long before retirement. And so we went, right, well, let's just fast forward that plan. Let's let's buy a farm. How hard can it be? And uh, we'll put some animals on it that we can milk and we'll start milking and we'll make commercial cheese. So we found a bit of property in an area of Tasmania that we loved. It's close to the airport, like it's a 30-minute drive to the airport, so I could do fly and fly out work to support us if I needed to. And it, there's also a couple of hospitals in town, one public hospital because healthcare in Australia is free for everyone and two private hospitals, which is obviously where you pay. And so we um, we bought a farm and then we thought about what animals we were going to put on it. Cows, we never discussed cows, ever. Cows were never an option. <laughs> but we did discuss buffalo. <laughs> so we, we're in a very temperate climate, so... Uh, in winter, it's about six to ten degrees as a maximum, and in summer, it's about twenty-three to twenty-six degrees maximum. Most of the time, we're in the high teens, and occasionally we get into thirty degrees. I cannot do Fahrenheit, so I'm not going to even attempt to help. This is all Celsius. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> 
curiously, it, you're 43 south, I'm 41 north. Like I'm in the same yeah. temperate zone, just flipped over the other side with New York City. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Uh, so we sort of looked at Buffalo because we sort of got into Buffalo a bit when we were living in Darwin. Um, <laughs> Yikes. Those are not little animals. <laughs> no, and they've got very big horns. But getting them across, because Tasmania is an island off the Australian mainland island. Oh, yeah. So getting them across. Can you put and, a buffalo in an airplane? No, but you can on a <laughs> Just boat. Just <laughs> You can put it on the ferry. Holy Toledo. Yeah. So we just went, nah, this is just not a great idea. Let's <laughs> let let's let's do let's let's have goats, you know? Goats are great creatures and they're small and uh we can get them because they're already in Tasmania. So we went yeah, into that was goats. My next question. <laughs> did you ask anybody about importing buffalo into Tasmania? Like, did you actually no. go to some official and say, could we get a permit? I, I would love to have seen that conversation. Uh, oh, <laughs> no, we didn't because I think we were far too sensible to realize that making mozzarella in Tasmania from a tropical <laughs> adapted species was Beast. possibly not <laughs> the best option as as an ecologist and a reasonably sensible yes. person yeah so that's how we got into making cheese and then podcasting mm. so that was 10 years ago it took us four years to get to the point that we were able to make cheese on a farm and two years to get the point that we were milking our own animals but the and we had to work hard. When I say hard, I mean so hard. Farming is really like hard. Like digging work. a ditch hard, right? <laughs> yeah, with a trowel, a hand trowel. No, <laughs> never quite that. But right. you know, long, long days and sacrificing a lot of. Well, you sacrifice a lot to be able to farm, especially starting up farming, where you have to put in all the infrastructure. You you paying for land, um, it, it, it's hard work uh, and it's much, much easier now. But the, the, the podcast grew from the fact that we were working our butts off and we were producing a fantastic product and I would hear from uh, colleagues, your cheese is really expensive to buy retail. Um, I can't believe that I have to pay this much for your cheese from the shop. This was actually before we'd taken over and put our cheese into the shops. But, um, you know, how, how could it possibly cost so much? So people didn't understand the true cost of food. People were blaming, um, and I think this was done by some of the mining and uh, petroleum companies, people were back blaming agriculture for the climate emissions and climate change because agriculture does have a substantial contribution to play to climate change. I think it's um, about 14% of total greenhouse gas emissions come from climate, uh, from agriculture. But at the end of the day, it's actually not agriculture that's the problem. It's burning fossil fuels. Right. And so I was getting really, <laughs> really frustrated with the anti-farmer sentiment that was circulating in Australia and around the world. And I was also getting really, really frustrated with militant vegans and movements that were happening in Australia where uh, bodies would come together and storm onto farms and farms not dissimilar to ours and um, set free the chickens which then the foxes and the wedge tail eagles promptly came and ate and, <laughs> came and, and killed right and the chickens were fine so yeah. you let them out <laughs> yeah and and um you know some other people went on to a, a goat farm in another part of australia and um you know took goats away and you know this is just this is this is not acceptable, and it was this anti-farmer, anti-agriculture kind of movement, and I felt very angry, very frustrated, and I felt that there was a lot that agriculture can offer to actually offset climate change, and I wanted to amplify that story. It's much much better now, much better understood, and much better heard. I think. COVID-19 has done a fantastic thing for agriculture because at least in Australia, people suddenly became aware of things like food supply chains and food security. Yes. 
And yes. they started to value when the supermarket shops were empty, they suddenly started to value their local farmer because they realized that they didn't know how to grow food. Only a farmer knows how to grow food. <laughs> Right. But still, there's still a lot that people don't understand. They don't understand the reliance that we have on China, for instance, to manufacture farm machinery or to manufacture for some of the broader, not our operation, but for various other operations to manufacture fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. Mm -hmm. These are things that I don't, we don't engage in, but they certainly have their place in in certain farming yeah, at methods. industrial scale those are key pieces that people don't yeah. understand is that they never see it like that all is all behind the scenes from their point of view it's just my beautiful red peppers come out of the supermarket yes yes i'm with you 100 so we have a little garden in the backyard yep yeah and and you realize how hard it is when the bloody snails get into your lettuce yet again or mm -hmm. your seedlings uh, mm -hmm. And so you start to appreciate how hard it is to grow food on a commercial scale and why it does cost money. I think Australia and America have the the cheapest food in the world and that's coming at a cost. So that's coming at a cost of things like the environment and it comes at a cost for wages, you know, We've got to work out how we can do all of the, the things and still supply people with good quality food. And it might just mean that people are going to have to start to pay more, which is a really difficult thing when the cost of living is so high in so many parts of the world. And I'm talking I, specifically I about exactly, the Western world. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know if it's just the Western world, but there's definitely an aspect of... Um, if you choose to live in an area that has a high cost of living, it's going to be a struggle. Like there's just going to be mm -hmm. so many things. Everything is more expensive. And there are things that you're going to be doing that you wouldn't be doing if you lived in a more rural area. So I, I think you you make a good point about, um, or, or maybe the, the story that you share shines a nice light on that you guys are clearly well-educated and you you like people would say you knew what you were getting into and then when you get into it you're like whoa there are layers of effort here layers of technology layers of things that even though we were already curious and inquisitive and educated you, you don't really realize until you dig in and and that leaves me thinking about um so the area that i'm in is eastern pennsylvania which is where rodale press used to be located so um j.i rodale is the guy who invented the word organic and the whole concept of all that is like walking distance so there are still farms here but not that many like when i grew up it, we used to be like my school bus ride would be 45 minutes of passing fields of cows and corn and you know that was and now it's housing developments and mm. there's a there's like a ratchet and it, it took, you know, a hundred years for that family to like get the fields working, get them producing, then they built a barn and then they have a corn silo. And they're like, th there's like this very slow buildup. And then in one, you know, a couple of weeks, nope, it becomes a housing development and you just it can't get that back. So I, I think it takes a lot of, um, or demonstrates a lot of courage on your part to like, oh, what would happen if we went and actually tried this? Um, courage is one word. You... <laughs> <laughs> I was being nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. What are you? Do you, um, I'm kind of wondering, like, what happened? What happened to your friend? Your your friend's bubble? Like, did you have a friend's bubble um, in <clears throat> in Sydney that just went see ya? You know, or like, <laughs> did you have, like all new friends now that you're over there, or is it like, is it a completely different society, or there's there like? you know, you still see your friends occasionally or like how, how much of a shift was it? Like, it's clearly a shift in terms of what you're doing, you know, for like, what are you doing today? Well, I go do this. I go build that, you know, as opposed to what you did six months, well, six months before you switched. But what about the people? Like how, what was the change for you for the types of people that you're now interacting with? Sydney was really interesting because the, the part of Sydney that we were living on gets referred to colloquially by the people who live there as well as other Sydney siders as the insular peninsula. So what we found was that it was really, really difficult to break into good friendship groups in Sydney because people had them already established. We didn't have kids at that stage, which meant that we didn't have those connections that you make through children's extracurricular right. activities in school. So, and because uh, one in five Australians live in Sydney, people come from, drain from all different parts of Sydney to go to work. 
So we had friends already established that lived in Sydney, like Ian's boss at the time. And I just went from hospital to hospital. I keep in touch with people, but we never really, there were, there were two people that we became friends with in our two and a half years in Sydney. And we still keep in touch with them through, um, mm. you know, social media, Facebook or something. Um, but we never really became embedded in the community in Sydney. We both went to university in Hobart, so 50 k's from where we live. And that, those formative years, that uh, late adolescence, early 20s, uh, is often that time when you form those lifelong friendships. So we came back to Tasmania with those friendship networks already in existence. And so we still slot in with our old friends, although we can't do as much socially as we used to. And at this <laughs> right. time of year, we have no social life whatsoever. But one of the things that has happened is that we've moved into a rural community. And six months after we moved into this community, there was a, an enormous bushfire that came through, a wildfire. And that was fantastic fantastic in a way we were very fortunate no one lost their life there was stock lost and there was property lost but the community really really came together and supported each other and we were able to be part of that and we also get involved in community not-for-profit organizations there's a local farmers market that we've both at various times been involved in and a local agricultural show that requires a lot of organization that at times we've both been involved in and so we've developed a fantastic uh, community around us and you know there's now our, our mates came visiting our farm one time and we just casually dropped into the conversation that the vineyard around the corner was for sale uh, a few weeks later, they bought said vineyard and now it's got an open cellar door. Mm. So, you know, once a month on a Sunday afternoon, the local community <laughs> gathers and we all have a drink together and it's it's absolutely delightful. So our social life looks very different, but at the point where we were, are in our lives, it probably would have looked different anyway now that we've got uh, primary school age children as well. So, mm. it, but but it's much more meaningful. Our relationships with other people are so much more meaningful because we're looking out for each other, we're helping each other and, um, you know, along with that comes the flip side where we're talking about each other from time to time. But really those relationships <laughs> are a lot more rewarding than the relationships that we had vastly, the relationships that we had with people in Sydney. So social life looks different. Friend bubble has just grown, really, which mm. has been absolutely wonderful. Terrific. I hate to say it, but we have to stop somewhere, and that's probably a great place. Uh, Kate, thanks for getting up early, taking the time, um, corralling the dog, and uh, thanks for doing the hard work. I mean, it's lots of people doing work and toil behind the scenes, I think, that are people that are going to make the change in the world. So that's just my two cents, but thanks. Thanks, Craig.